All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Ashley Farmer and I'm co-director of learning and engagement at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. And I wanna welcome you to this evening's program, a Mexican art and history lesson, Chocolate from Mesoamerica to Utah, presented in partnership with Artes de Mexico in Utah. I am excited for this evening's fascinating conversation and it's my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's presenters. Before that, I would like to acknowledge that the UMFA is situated on land which is named for the Ute tribe and is the unceded traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah and the Utah Museum of Fine Arts, the UMFA, acknowledge the significance of place and the continued existence and contributions of indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this land for thousands of years. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's and the UMFA's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. I would also like to share some guideposts for our evening together. At the UMFA, we appreciate that each person brings their personal experience to their understanding of art and culture, and we acknowledge their multiple perspectives. As such, we aim to create a loving, brave space that doesn't tolerate hatred, racism, sexism, ableism. In short, we encourage respectful dialogue and appreciate a diversity of voices and perspectives. So having, having said that, I am so uh, excited and pleased to introduce you to this amazing group of panelists this evening. Um, I'm gonna introduce the three now before I turn it over to our partner and collaborator. So our first presenter is Luke Kelly, Associate Curator of Collections and Antiquities at the UMFA. For the museum's reopening in August, 2017, Luke revamped the ancient Mesoamerican installation, updating labels with new research. He is currently working with scholars on the translation of the museum's Mayan artifacts. In addition to conducting provenance research on the ancient art in the permanent collection, he has researched and lectured on the issues surrounding the collecting of ancient art. Our second presenter is Lisa Thompson, exhibit developer and interpretive planner at Natural History Museum of Utah. As NHMU's exhibit developer, Lisa Thompson crafts compelling stories about nature and culture to share with museum visitors. She works with curators, designers, and community members to select topics for exhibits, develop concept plans, and write the labels for exhibits large and small. She led the conceptual development and coordinated the public programs for the museum's first major in-house special exhibit Weaving a Revolution, a Celebration of Contemporary Navajo Baskets in 2013, and developed the concept, content, and many media pieces for the museum's second in-house special exhibit, Nature All Around Us, in 2019. Lisa has also served on the NHMU Diversity and Inclusion Committee since 2014, and has focused on nurturing meaningful community partnerships. Lisa received an MA in American History from the University of Washington and an AB from Stanford University in American Studies. Currently, she is taking Spanish lessons twice a week and loves talking with her maestro about Mexican history, archaeology, and culture. And our third presenter I am so happy to introduce is Esmeralda Torres, bilingual educator. Esmeralda Torres is a Mexican bilingual educator born in Tuzla Gutierrez, Chiapas, Mexico. She lives in West Valley City, Utah with her husband, sister, and three children. Her Zoke Maya identities and ancestral traditions have been preserved through her mother's devoted cultural sustaining efforts, including the traditional Maya chocolate making process. So we're very uh, pleased and honored to introduce uh, these three people who will share in conversation with one another this evening. And now it's my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator for this evening, Fanny Blauer, Director of Artes de Mexico in Utah, and to introduce you to Fanny. A native of Mexico and graduate of the Instituto Politecnico Nacional, Fanny Guadalupe Blauer has worked as an accountant in Mexico and the US. She's the Executive Director for Artes de Mexico in Utah 
and a passionate presenter of cultural workshops. She works as a translator and interpreter for the Natural History Museum of Utah. Fanny recently earned an Anthropology of Art diploma from the Center for Research and Advanced Studies Social Anthropology. And so it's my pleasure to now turn this over to Fanny, um, a partner with which we're uh, so pleased and grateful to work with um, for this evening. Thank you, Fanny. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you everyone who is present today. And thank you to all these amazing friends and partners that um, accepted our invitation to participate and collaborate. Uh, Artes in Mexico and Utah's mission is to build communities and a sense of belonging united by cultural connections through the appreciation and creation of art. And it is precisely what we are doing here. We are appreciating the value of those uh, objects that belong to the museum that reflect the voices of our community. And we are also creating art by the community, by the art of creating conversation with the voices of our community. So I'm very thankful to the museum for this opportunity as we expand our uh, goals to be more inclusive and diverse. Um, our intention today is very simple. These objects are meaningful to many of us. So what we want to do is to create conversation with different perspectives. I'm very pleased to have today uh, the voice of the curator at the museum who provides the, the knowledge of this object and how representative it is for the museum. And then I have invited Lisa Thompson, uh, my partner and colleague when I was working at the Natural History Museum of Utah, as a community liaison to provide the archaeological findings of chocolate and, and talk about the community and connections that this delicious food uh, carries as an element of our history. And then Esmeralda Torres, who is our community advocate, teacher, and educator, who also is here to provide the perspective of the community and how this object creates this great interconnections between culture and science. So I'm very pleased to have that today. And with that, I would like to pass, well, but before that, I would like to see the results of the poll. Uh, maybe Ashley or Maggie? Yes, that is the correct answer. Nahuatl is the origin of the word chocolate. And I don't speak Nahuatl, sadly, my grandfather was Nahua, uh, but he didn't speak the language and I didn't learn the language as, as I was a child. Uh, but the, word, the correct way to say this, I believe, is chocolatl, with an emphasis with a T and L at the end. And with that, I would like to pass to Luke. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you. Um, could we start sharing the screen, please? Okay. Um, next slide. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so the two objects I'm going to talk about tonight are from our museum's ancient Mesoamerican collection. And the origins of that collection go back to about 1967 when our first director, professional director, Frank Sanguinetti was hired. When he came to the museum and saw the collection, he noticed there was European art, Egyptian art, but there was really no examples from the Americas, from other parts of the world. And he felt this was very important. He had taught art history at Arizona and the cultures of ancient Mesoamerica, people were just beginning to discover the stories of the Olmec, the Maya, the Aztec. And he felt this was a great story to incorporate into the museum because the museum was to be a place of learning for college students and to have examples of art from all of the world's cultures, not just a couple. And so Frank in the 1970s and 80s worked with primarily one dealer, named, a man named Douglas Hay. And he began to amass a collection representing examples of art from the ancient Olmec, the Zapotec, the Maya, uh, 
I'm still in the process, the journey myself, of discovering how Douglas Haig was able to acquire such pieces and to um, sell them to Frank, who then brought them into the Museum of Fine Arts. But these objects today have taken on even greater meaning because Utah has become such a great melting pot. Sorry for the bad chocolate pun, but I thought it was meaningful here because it allows people to go and visit and see art by possibly their own ancestors from around the world. Now, the story of these two objects, uh, when I reinstalled the collection back in 2017, I placed them together. And the reason I placed them together was that I was looking at the Maya, Mayan concepts and symbols of power in the classic period from about 300 to 900. But little did I know that there was gonna be an even greater connection than power in these two vessels, and that is cacao. Next slide, please. These objects date from a time when the Maya city-states were at their height, and we're only beginning to understand that great cities like Tikal, Palenque are just the tip of the iceberg. Using ground penetrating radar in the jungles, they're starting to discover sites that could have supported inhabitants upwards of 30 to 40,000 people. Uh, archaeologists believe that what is, in terms of Maya archaeology, we're not at the middle or the end, we are just at the beginning and there's so much more yet to discover. Next slide, please. For the Maya, uh, cacao was one ancient Maya and modern Maya, cacao was one of the most important crops. In the Popol Vol, the Maya creation myth that was uh, written down in the 16th century, it was one of the original gifts of the gods. It was even so important that it was part of the sarcophagus of the seventh century ruler Palenque Pakal, who represented the fruit trees that sustained the Maya population on his sarcophagus. And this image here is of, of the cacao tree um, that was part of that sarcophagus. Uh, next slide, please. As Mayan glyphs be, have begun to become translated, we are now upwards of 90% able to read the glyphs that were written between about 100 and 900. Uh, in no small part to the help of mo the modern Maya, who working with archeologists are able to basically reverse engineer modern Maya words to go back to the ancient Maya words and to discover them in the glyphs. Uh, this is the glyph for cacao, cacao uh, and uh, we have discovered that the Maya, ancient Maya, really loved chocolate because this was on many of the ceramics. Uh, kind of in reference and homage, or just uh, you know, just fun that uh, the modern term for a cacao tree is theobromo cacao, and theobromo is Greek, meaning food of the gods. And so, for the ancient Maya, it was seen as food of the gods, and it's still that title is still in it today. Next slide, please. Now, the Maya were not the first civilization to enjoy chocolate um, as a drink or as, as part of food. Uh, that goes back to the Olmec, who we believe were the first ones to have made their, uh, who have, to have prepared chocolate. The Maya themselves though were, we first thought was only in the classic period that were enjoying chocolate, but now through uh, tests, um, we've discovered that as early as 600 BC, the Maya were also enjoying chocolate as a drink. Next slide, please. One problem though for the Maya, uh, that the Maya had covered such a large area and there's inhabitants in large cities, very small and few areas in the Maya region could sustain to grow cacao. And so what ends up happening, it becomes a very big luxury item. It also becomes an object that Maya city-states will compete with one another uh, to, control, to control to have access to those resources um, and becomes one of the Maya's most desired luxury items. Next slide, please. Now, because cacao is a luxury item, it could be a source of tribute. The unique aspect of Maya ceramics compared to ceramics from other cultures around the world is 
in addition to showing deities or the stories of the gods, the Mayan gods, these ceramics could also commemorate and discuss uh, historical events. So this vessel with the tribute scene actually commemorated an actual historic event. Next slide, please. The individuals presented on this band of uh, the bowl are all lords, uh, each of them overseeing a city. Only the one in the dark red at the, far, at the right is the overlord. Uh, during the, the classic Maya period, the city-states, smaller city-states would be under the protection or under the control of a larger city. And as part of that protection or control, the smaller cities would have to pay tribute. And you see here is a tribute of three cities to one of the Maya overlords. What do you bring as tribute? Well, you can bring uh, gifts of cloth. Or as you see in the middle section, middle, uh, you can bring offerings of cacao beans. Cacao beans had reached to the point that a luxury item that they could almost be considered currency. Uh, what we do not know from the Maya is the exact value of the cacao bean. We have to look later on to the Aztecs with written material um, by Spanish explorers that shows that how cacao could be used to barter for goods, everything from animals to textiles to accessories. And even in Aztec times that if you were bartering unequal objects, you could always use cacao beans to equal, uh, to make up the difference. Next slide, please. Now, the fun thing about this vase is it has two different stories. And the first story was when we purchased the object in 1984. Um, and when we put it, when uh, Frank bought it, it was for a very different reason. Um, because in the mid 1970s, an archeologist had looked at this vessel and he was providing what was a very rough translation of the glyphs, the band of glyphs around the midpoint. Uh, more attention though was paid to the top. You see, if you notice the jaguar pelt and the archeologist was very excited about that because jaguar pelts were a symbol of Maya elite and that this must, be, must have been made for an elite of the Maya or a priest of the ancient Maya civilization. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, is from a cylinder vase at the New Orleans Museum of Art. But you can see here what is wonderful about this is that it not only shows uh, the dark red, but the jaguar pelt worn by the elite, it shows that ceramics themselves were prestige items, that they were produced by the royal court to give as gifts from one lord to another. The glyphs that you see in the top are written by male and female nobles of the Maya elite who have been trained to read and to produce those glyphs. Um, but what you see here is the Lord sitting on a platform and that vessel was for drinking cacao. Next slide, please. So the rough translation based on the archeologist from the 1970s said this was a, obviously this, Band of Glyphs was a chant to the Maya underworld. And he based it on what he knew, the glyph knowledge at that time, which was still very rudimentary. But then also that because many of vessels with these uh, glyphs were found in burials. So it was seeming to be a logical assumption. Well, in late 2016, Mayan epigrapher Mark Van Stone paid a visit to the museum and went through our collection and looked at this vessel and he concentrated on the band of glyphs that you can see in the detail here. And it's not a chant to the underworld. The rough translation um, is that this is a vessel for drinking tree fresh cacao, uh, which for the classic Maya were, was made from the cacao root bulk, um, which was one, a wonderful thing because all of a sudden we had a chocolate drinking vessel in our collection. Next slide, please. What is very fascinating about the Maya is that cacao beans not only travel within the Maya world, but outside of it. 
this is an image of the Maya god, god El, with a merchant pack and cacao tree that you would see that would be the time of the classic period. Maya merchants loading up and going outside the Maya homeworld into um, other areas, trading cacao beans. And it's not surprising that even during the time when Maya, the great Maya city states started to dwindle in population, the trade for cacao was still quite active in ancient Mesoamerica. Next slide, please. So it's no surprise 300, 400 years later with the Aztec empire, cacao plays just as an important role as it did during the Maya as a drink and enjoyment of the elite. Uh, people, the elite class. Next slide, please. What I love about this one is uh, the Aztec tribute list from the Kodak Mendoza, which was uh, showing a tribute that Aztec's uh, uh, power would have to, a city would have to give the Aztec empire in exchange for protection. And here you have, you know, con continuity. You have images of jaguar pelts, but then right next to it, you also have cacao beans. Uh, and much like the Maya, uh, they also had their own long distance merchants who traveled far and wide offering cacao beans in exchange for other goods throughout Mesoamerica. And final slide, please. So it's no stretch of the imagination to think that the Maya or at, uh, Aztec merchants are able to go far and wide because if you think about cacao beans and modern chocolate and ancient chocolate, who would not want to have chocolate? And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. This is such an interesting uh, research. And what I love is that one vessel, one base carries so much history. And now we're going to learn about how is that connected to Utah? And with that, I would like to pass to Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Fanny. And Fanny, I'm not at home today. And if my internet connection is starting to get unstable, let me know and I'll cut my video and hopefully that will help it. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And we're going to carry this story forward with a, a Utah cacao connection. Uh, next slide, please. So our story is going to begin in Chaco Canyon, which is not in Utah, it is in New Mexico. Um, and our story is uh, starting to take place, oh, let's say around uh, 1000 AD, 1100 AD, when Chaco is becoming a really complex uh, uh, a city conglomerate kind of, you can see that there are multi-story buildings being built here. Um, and this is uh, the ancestral Puebloan people, sometime uh, formerly known as the Anasazi. Today, we call them the ancestral Puebloan. And next slide, please. And archeologists think there, this was also a highly important ceremonial site where there would have been elite priests gathered. Many of these circular structures here are interpreted to be kivas. Uh, next slide, please. And Chaco was also um, really interconnected in its region. The yellow uh, lines on this uh, map are showing prehistoric roads that connected Chaco out to other great houses um, that are those little red dots around its region. So it's a place where you know, people are coming in and out of, and there's a lot of ceremonial activity going on. Next slide, please. When uh, Chaco was being excavated in the 1890s, there were several uh, caches found of these interesting long cylindrical vases. Um, they tended to be grouped together in just a few rooms. And I think there was something like 181 of them all told, but archeologists weren't really sure what to make of them at the time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the early 2000s, an archaeologist named Patricia Crown, who is at the University of New Mexico, noticed that the form of these vessels was somewhat similar to the Maya uh, cylindrical vases, that, like the one that Luke was just showing us. And so she did some investigation, uh, talking with other colleagues about what those Maya vases had been used for, Maya vessels. And um, 
not that, uh, just a few years earlier, um, a fellow, I think it's interesting, he was at the Hershey Institute, had developed a test for testing this pottery and in Mayan vessels was able to find traces of cacao. And so Patricia Crown uh, was able to test, she didn't test these vessels themselves, but she tested uh, fragments of um, vessels that were found in trash middens because it's a destructive test that she was using. And lo and behold, she discovered, next slide please, uh, the chemical markers of cacao. And so um, it's not, unfortunately, she's not able to, you know, just lick the, the sherds and taste delicious cacao. What um, she's finding through a chromatography process are these uh, two hallmarks of cacao, uh, theobromine and caffeine. They're both stimulants. And theobromine is the, the uh, chemical that makes uh, chocolate toxic to dogs because they don't have the enzymes to process it. So now we have evidence of cacao, which can't be grown anywhere uh, in what is now the United States uh, in New Mexico. Um, so it's having to come 1200 miles to the north to reach Chaco Canyon. But I promised you a story about Utah. So let's, let's uh, move on and get to the Utah part of the story. So the next chapter starts with this mysterious red pottery that comes from Utah. Um, it's generally called redware. Their particular style that we're going to talk about is called um, Abajo Red on Orange. Um, but what's curious about it is that it shows up about 750 AD in the southwest, or excuse me, southeast corner of Utah in what's today San Juan County just all of a sudden, out of nowhere. There's no precedence for it um, in previous pottery styles. And archeologists have always been really puzzled about why did it suddenly appear? And if you, next slide, please. It, because it wasn't like the ancestral Puebloan didn't already have just absolutely gorgeous pottery. You know, they had all these beautiful black on white wares and black on gray wares that they're making. So why all of a sudden do they need this uh, red ware? Um, and part of the um, uh, mystery begins to be solved when they, uh, archaeologists start testing the clay that the redwares are made of. And they find that it comes from a really specific area. And so I've circled on this map um, an area that includes the villages of Alkali, Alkali Ridge, Monument Village, and Cave Canyon Village. And they're all running along Montezuma Creek. And they're finding that all the, the redware clay is coming from this specific area, but the redwares themselves are traveling out to other villages uh, in the area. They, they appear to be very highly valued. And so another archeologist uh, by the name of Dorothy Washburn heard about Patricia Crown's re research and she decided, she was wondering, well, is there some connection between you know, cultures further south and this new redware, this new technology appearing suddenly out of nowhere in Southern Utah, and could cacao be linked to it? So next slide, please. Um, she decides to test these uh, two um, uh, Abajo red on orange vessels that are from the Peabody Museum. And they come from that small site that we saw called Alkali Ridge. And uh, if we look at the next slide, we can see a map of Alkali Ridge and see how different it was from Chaco. Um, so this is Alkali Ridge at about 750 AD. So, you know, roughly 200 years um, before Chaco. Um, and what you're seeing in this um, slide, this map is showing um, the ancestral Puebloan culture in transition. The round little uh, circles are representing pit houses, which were an older form of dwelling. And just about this time, uh, masonry buildings are starting to come in. So you see those little squares are representing um, some new masonry structures. Um, the part that is in dotted lines down at the bottom is showing a part of the site that hasn't been excavated yet. So Alkali Ridge is not Chaco by any stretch of the imagination. It's just kind of your average, you know, uh, uh, P1 ancestral Pueblo and village at the time. You know, nothing particularly remarkable about it, except that there is redware there. So Dorothy Wash, oh, and I, if you go to the next slide, you can see again, um, you know, when you go to Alkali Ridge, you're not visiting Chaco with these you know, tremendous multi-story buildings. I've circled a little bit of a kind of rubble wall that you can see at Alkali uh, Ridge. 
But the Dorothy uh, Washburn goes ahead with a different kind of test. Instead of a destructive test, she's using a test where she's rinsing out the bowls with hot water and then testing, um, doing various processes to this water and trying to uh, find the chemical markers of cacao in it. And lo and behold, next slide, she finds the chemical markers of cacao in um, these red on orange um, bowls from Southern Utah dating to about 750 AD. So now we have chocolate 1500 miles north of the nearest site where it can be grown. And you know, this is the earliest evidence of cacao uh, in what is now the United States. And it's not at some um, large site where there's going to be a more hierarchical society with elites who are going to be drinking cacao. So this is a really interesting result. And, and not only that, if we look at the next slide, um, Dorothy Washburn didn't just find a little bit of cacao. She tested um, 20 vessels and she found cacao in uh, 15 of them. And so um, if you're looking at the, uh, the, her results, you see there's a column for theobromine and you see how NF is not found, but look how many of them don't have NF. And if you look again over at uh, caffeine, you see how many of those vessels she found with caffeine in them. Now, there's some skepticism about her results because she didn't find any theophylline, which is another chemical marker of cacao. And the proportions of the theobromine to caffeine are a little bit off for what they should be for cacao. So there's some skeptics out there about what, you know, is this really cacao? Um, but she's published later results to, to try to bolster these initial ones. But for Dorothy Washburn, what this really raises is a, a fascinating question about um, the um, cultures of Mesoamerica and their connection to what we consider today the American Southwest. So if we look at the next slide, for a long time, um, archeologists, had thought that the cultures of the American Southwest, we see the ancestral Puebloan, the Mogollon, the Hocom, um, had, they definitely were influenced by um, the cultures of Mesoamerica. After all, they're growing corn, which has come north from Mexico, but they developed more or less independently. But looking at this map, you can see how many of them are overlapping and how many of them are contiguous and you know, right adjacent to each other. And so this um, supports an idea that Dorothy Washburn advocates, and if we go to the next slide, which is that not only are these um, uh, cultures connected by trade routes that we can see here, we know that um, uh, macaw feathers, copper bells, other luxury goods are traveling north along these trade routes. We also know that turquoise from mines, particularly in Arizona, are traveling south along these trade routes. But not only are they connected by trade routes, but they're connected by people. She would argue that the um, redware and the cacao that's associated with it represent an actual migration of people from uh, further south into the uh, American Southwest. And she would say that these migrations happened repeatedly over time, the, and that there's this constant flow back and forth between the um, American Southwest and Mesoamerica. If we go to the next slide, um, um, one of the Natural History Museum of Utah's archaeologists, Glenna Nelson Grimm, has been continuing the search for cacao because there was some skepticism about Dorothy Washburn's results. And so Glenna decides she's going to jump in and see if she can um, replicate those results. The first pieces she tested were in an exhibit that the, the museum created. Um, and um, she selected them because they represented things that you might drink from or serve cacao from. Um, but the test that she did revealed negative results. Um, she believes this is because these pieces were collected on a very early archeological expedition when archeology span was kind of making that transition from a hobby into an actual profession. And she's not sure how these um, pieces were treated. They could have been scrubbed out before that they were put in the museum and then any traces of cacao would have been uh, removed from them. But not to be deterred, Glenna has continued testing um, a variety of pieces. And if we go to the next slide, um, she has been able to extend the um, uh, positive results for cacao beyond Alkali Ridge to those two other little villages we saw, the Cave Canyon and uh, the Monument um, Village. So she has positive results for cacao uh, from those two locations. 
And she's told me recently that um, archaeologists have also gotten positive results from cacao in Arizona, um, other villages in uh, New Mexico, as well as in Colorado. So all of a sudden, this what uh, you know has long been thought of as this kind of elite luxury item appears to be on the very northern hinterlands you know of of the uh, mesoamerican you know cultural i don't know sphere um and starting to appear with you know some regularity questions remain as far as i know like there have been no actual cacao beans found you would think we might find you know some traces of those but the evidence is growing that the cacao was making regular journeys on those trade routes north. Then archaeologists continue to debate whether or not that represents those traders that Luke was telling us about making these long distance journeys to trade for things, maybe turquoise to bring south, or is this actual migrations of people that are keep pulsing to the north? And um, I want to bring this story very quickly into the historic period. Utah has a really interesting um, uh, connection to chocolate once it's being settled by Euro-Americans, if we can have the next slide. And part of that is connected to the sugar beet industry that pops up here and makes sugar um, a commodity that, that is readily available. If we go to the next slide, um, and then a number of um, chocolate makers pop up in Utah, and one of them, J.G. McDonald's, actually becomes a world famous chocolate maker and is um, winning uh, four, I believe it was like 44 grand prizes at international uh, chocolate festivals and became really well known. And then this um, history of the, in the early uh, 20th century of chocolate making, or excuse me, 19th century chocolate making continues into the present. And I hope many of you are aware, if we look at the next slide, that Utah has become kind of a hotbed of artisanal chocolate makers. Um, and it, it really is a pleasure to be able to sample um, uh, bean to bar chocolates that are again being, uh, that are being manufactured uh, with beans to reflect the particular flavors of the soils that they are grown in from you know, Mesoamerica and, and South America and beyond chocolates grown all over the world today but that um, many award-winning chocolate makers are now based in Utah. And so um, if you haven't already, I, I urge you to take advantage of this modern incarnation of this really ancient uh, tradition in Utah. And with that, I'm going to um, pass the baton to Esmeralda. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. This is, I'm here with my red clay cup, drinking chocolate to honor our talk today and thinking how this red clay has made such a journey connected from my country, Mexico, to Utah. Esmeralda, thank you. Hello, I'm Esmeralda Torres. Can, uh, yeah. can you go to the next slide? Uh, the next slide, thank you. So we have heard from uh, from Lisa and Luke and how these um, people have, uh, or this this cacao has been, has traveled uh, through borders, and we see we 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 find also um, cacao down in in um, in Central America and South America. And a question jumps out as I was uh, listening to their talks, uh, their presentations was uh, you know why do these people? Uh, how was the, uh, what was the purpose for carrying those um, uh, the cacao um, in? To different parts of the world and going north. So I'm going to share a cultural perspective um, from uh, my uh, traditions and and uh, the the question goes back to me: Why do I keep this tradition? And I like to share my my reasons and the purpose why my family keeps this this tradition. We are from uh, Mexico, uh, from Chiapas in the south, and um, we um, are. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is this is Chiapas, and as you see, there are different um, ethnic groups that um, that uh, settled in and, and developed develop in, in Chiapas. My family comes from the Soque and the Mayan, um, the, the those indigenous roots, and also Spanish. Spanish. Um, so our our tradition has been kept from uh, for for centuries, or not centuries, or generations. And um, uh, as you see in this slide, the, um, the Mayan is the, um, 
the, the Mayan developed in the uh, in the green uh, or the region that is, is uh, highlighted in green, and the soque is highlighted in yellow. So these are my two indigenous roots where um, we um, we uh, got this or the tradition has been kept. So on the, um, the Mayan side, uh, we continue to have uh, to keep this tradition of growing the cacao. My uh, um, my um, uh, family in um, in Suchiate, Ciudad de Hidalgo, um, that it's northern uh, or border with Guatemala. They keep this plantation. Can you uh, move to the next slide or two more slides? One more, sorry, one more. Okay, so this, these, this is my family. They still grow uh, the cacao and they do have other, other trees that, um, that they grow, but they continue um, to have this plantation. My great-grandfather was the one that um, uh, started with this plantation, uh, Rosalia Cordova Arreola and my Mayan um, great-grandmother. Uh, and together they, um, they begin uh, with this, uh, this family business. Uh, they they do it commercially as well. Uh, can we go back to slides back? Sorry. <laughs> uh, can we go back? Mm -hmm. oh, one more. Thank you. All right. And so on the soke um, on the soke side, are we learned the uh, how to make chocolate. The uh, the regions where my mom. Um, I'm going to talk more more about my mom because she's the the one that taught our family and that has kept the traditions. Uh, strongly, and more uh, or strong, um, yeah, strongly. And um, uh, compared to to her cousins and uh, another family, she's she's the one that has been keeping the uh, keeping and promoting the tradition in, among in my family in Utah and in Chiapas as well. Um, so she was born in Copainala in the north the north region of of Chia, um, Chiapas in the Soke region. My ancestors um, from my mom's and, and father's side are all Soke, uh, except for my mom, she's mestizo and she has both Mayan and Soke and Spanish. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so these are my um, my Soke ancestors and my Mayan and Spanish ancestors. This is my mom, Rosvita Aquino Cordoba, and my dad, Francisco Jeremias Lopez Sanchez. Can we go to the next uh, two slides? Thank you. One more. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the uh, our tradition uh, of making um, making our leg legacy of, of chocolate makers. So um, my uh, my mom's first memory of uh, uh, watching someone making uh, chocolate was from my great grandmother. So with her family, they have all um, like a commercial business of trading business. Uh, they traded grains and, um, and, and meats and uh, different things. But um, the uh, one of the most uh, fun me memories about chocolate was watching my great great mom, great great grandmother <laughs> uh, make chocolate with her, her sisters. And, um, and now uh, they pass it along to my great grandmother, and she was the one that taught my mom to to do the chocolate. Um, can we go to the next slide? So um, this is Mama Chindita, my great grandmother. My mom. Um, it was a custom to 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 send some of, or to send some of the uh, the children. To live with uh, with grandmas, or you know, to be a, um, a, uh, to accompany them, or to be a companion. So my mom spent most of her youth uh, with my great grandmother. That's how she she learned all the ways, uh, the indigenous ways to to do um, the the chocolate the chocolate process. So my machinita was um, the one that taught her and all all. Um, uh, how to how to use the metate? I'm gonna show um, a little, uh, do a little demonstration of some of the things that, that we use or 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 a process of making chocolate. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Once uh, once my mom married my dad, 
um, we were lucky enough to that my grandma also had this tradition. So we um, we had we enjoyed uh, chocolate recipes uh, at home with mom with my mom and with her family and as well with my dad. So I remember uh, from my memories uh, to using the chocolate and making tamales. Yeah, uh, making the mole for the tamales with my grandma, and so we get we would gather around the big table, and um, and we all had uh you know different uh, different things to do and uh, responsibilities, and so we we kind of learned the ways of how to do the uh, uh, how to do the mole, how to do the tamales, and and different um different cho chocolate or cacao um, recipes. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is the, the chocolate process. Um, so uh, as if we see, there's there's a tree and um, the, the fruit is edible and it's very sweet. Uh, we can uh, use the fruit to make uh, a cold, a cold a sweet drink. Um, that I, I really enjoyed when, when I would go to Suchiate. I'm from Tuxla. So um, the, I was able to, to see this, um, the, the trees and the plantation and the fruit uh, by going to Suchiate. So I, I, I'm glad that my mom thought um, had this, um, this love for her, for her family and for keeping our traditions and, and uh, keeping the, our families together. And to be able to to have uh, continue with the content connections with my other uh, relatives down in Suchiate, Chiapas, and so the um, so they they count the pot and then open up the the uh, uh, the fruit and use the eat the fruit and then the seeds is where the uh, the cacao comes from, and or the the chocolate comes from. This is the these are the cacao. Um, seeds. Then we um, they put it on the uh, out to dry in the sun, and um, if from the seeds um, that's where I began the process. I, I wasn't part of growing the uh, the plant, but um, I was lucky enough to to have that uh, um, the uh, well to have the opportunity to learn the uh, the chocolate process at home. And uh, so we toasted or seared the cacao. Uh, after we uh, we toasted there, if you, the the middle part of the cacao um, usually gets uh, harder or not harder, but um, darker when it's toasted. And so we uh, we would try and see if the it, the cacao was uh, was right um, to or well well toasted to be able to peel it all the way. So we peeled the cacao. Um, some people. Uh, use uh, or process the the uh, the cacao to make chocolate uh, with the peel on. But in my family, our tradition was to peel it. And for my mom, was like, okay, we it has to be more pure. It has to be better. And we don't want you know the peels uh, on the with the cacao on the chocolate. And so we would do that that um, as children, and we continue to do that with our family. Um, not as often as we did in, in Chiapas, but we try to, to continue this, uh, uh, this tradition. So after doing that, we grind the cacao and make chocolate. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so um, uh, I wanna show you uh, what, after this slide, I wanna show you uh, the, uh, the materials we use or the, the grains and um, and the tools we use to to uh, do this process. So um, as children, we as I said before, we participating in this uh, in this tradition and doing other um, making other recipes as well, uh, like pozol. So pozol is very interesting because um, uh, so pozol is um, is uh, made with uh, corn and cacao and. Um, so th th there is a, a special meaning for uh, for uh, pozol um, that uh, our, our indigenous brothers and sisters in down in, in Chiapas continue to to practice, and uh, it has the religious meaning, and they they continue using it as their in ceremonies for when for for the harvest and to have a good 
uh, to have good um, um, good harvest. And so they they do that, and they set it on the they they set it kind of like in altars as we do for Dia de los Muertos. They also do these altars and they they um, they kind of like the tribute as as Luke was was talking about. It does have that religious meaning, and so they they mix the uh, the corn and the cacao and water, and so they they mix it up to drink it. So the 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 special meaning is as look I mentioned before, the um the our our family and our our people in in Mexico um, continue to have to honor our um, our ancestors. And also, um, the indigenous people continue to to ask for blessings from from the uh, the gods, from the uh, the uh, the Mayan gods, and um, and so the uh, it has um, it, it means life. So we um, we uh, uh, as we put the grain or the the processed grain in the, and mix it with with the water. If we drink just uh, if we only drink the water, it's just uh, um, we're not respecting our uh, uh, we're not respecting Earth and the gods because um, they are giving us this gift of life. So we have to move it around so we can drink all of its nutrients: uh, the water, the uh, and and uh, the cacao. And um, and the maize or, or corn. Um, so this is a hikara. Okay, we serve it a hikara, and as, I'm just gonna read it from here. This uh, is a, a vessel made of a, a tree um, that is um, like, well, in Mayan says is named Ushim Ashim, and um, so this. Uh, this is uh, uh, like the similar, similar to the vessels that we we were um, we were uh, uh, learning about uh, from Ashley and and Luke, or sorry, Lisa and Luke. Um, we we drink this as a tradition. We drink the chocolate or the sorry the pozol from this um, from this vessel. Uh, these are other. I'm gonna skip some slides. Can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, the next slide. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to mention two important things about our tradition. Going back to the question, why do we keep this tradition? Um, the first one is, um, as uh, um, Luke was uh, was saying, that this is um, something to uh, well from from his uh, presentation and in, in this talk about keeping um to be in uh to get ha, get this energy from um from earth uh, or this gift of life uh, my mom's always says okay this is you need to drink uh you need to drink this especially in utah that uh for the cold seasons so this is a way for to keep my children uh with energy and um another important uh uh, meaning for our family is the um, las vivencias, so the the lived experiences uh, as a family. So is this a way to to keep our family united and, and continue our traditions? So um, we continue to we try. Uh, can we go to the next? Oh no, this slide. We try to to uh, continue with this tradition. And, and teach it to our uh, to our children so they can continue with the uh, the connectedness with our ancestors so we they know who they are they know who they come from and uh, th this that's um, that's our, our purpose of keeping this tradition uh, another uh, important way to honor our ancestors is to to promote the uh, the value of this tradition of keeping our traditions um, the uh, next slide, please. So um, we have had the chance to share this in the community at presentations or um, at museums and schools. Uh, this is down in, in New Mexico, and uh, it's very nice 
to feel connected with other people that had they also have similar traditions and it, that um it has a great meaning to me, and I'm pretty sure that everybody that we can find, everybody can find some connectedness among uh, different cultures, and it gives us some kind of um, a feeling of okay, I belong to my ancestors, I belong to a culture, I belong to uh, to traditions, to um, to a family, and uh, that's one thing that I gather from from my traditions, from continuing this uh, uh, efforts to share these um, art traditions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esmeralda. It's such a pleasure to hear your personal stories and connections to, to chocolate and cacao. Do, do I, ha I have um, a few minutes or I'm done, or is my time up? <laughs> Uh, well, your time is up. Um, okay. And probably spend one more minute. You want to show us the? Objects? Oh, just uh, yeah. I just want to show the the objects. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I didn't spend too much time talking. So these this is a metate, and uh, here are the some um, grains that are having already uh, been toasted. So this is what we break, right? And then um as uh, you maybe you have seen this uh with corn so we also have this tradition of uh grinding grinding the uh the, the cacao in uh metate the uh indigenous tools or uh that from our ancestors this is the the raw cacao seeds um that is already dried and um we also use the grinder and this are some this is how it comes out but uh when you process it uh for like two or three times it gets soft really soft and and that's when you are able to um to uh, to uh, mold it or to uh, work it as a, as a dough and then it comes it becomes really hard <laughs> Uh, and then we can store it and use it for later to make hot chocolate. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Esmeralda. I, I love to see, I can wait to have this workshop in person as we did it once at the Natural History Museum of Utah where people were fascinated to learn about the whole process. And you brought your whole family. That's what I love. That yeah. connection <laughs> everything. One thing that I think is so important to mention is that uh, when we talk about food and culture, we talk about community and everybody participates that. Uh, I, I also love the fact that you mentioned how corn and, um, and, and cacao is so connected to the as a say, symbols of sacred life. Uh, and with that, I would like to open the room for convert for questions. Uh, I invite the audience to submit your questions in the chat. We will review them. And if you have any questions to any of the panelists, feel free to type your question and we will read them to, you, uh, to them. I see one question here. Uh, let me just check this. Um, the first question that I see is, ooh, Okay, let's see. Shannon is asking, has any of the red wear from Alkali Ridge been found along those trades routes we saw on a slide? Was it valued by other groups? That is a great question. So um, the red wares have been found distributed around kind of the, the four corners area. Um, which is different than other ancestral Puebloan pottery. Archaeologists believe that most villages had their own potter who was making the black on 
uh, white wares or the black on gray wares, but that the red wear is being traded out as far like as Mesa Verde, which is pretty remarkably far to trade something like pottery, which is, you know, not easy to transport. And there was some question at first, are they transporting something in the redware or is it the redware itself that's valuable? And archeologists, uh, the current theory is that it's the redware that itself that's valuable. And it pers what's interesting also is that it persists over a long time. And if you come to the Natural History Museum of Utah in the First People's Gallery in the case where the redware is, you can see a pot that that has been broken but repaired and sutured back together. And Glenna talks about this like, you know, this is being heirloomed, this is being passed down through generations because it's something that's really valuable. As, as to whether it's being going on the trade routes, I don't believe so, in part because pottery is a difficult, you know, kind of heavy, fragile thing to transport, but also because there are redwares in other cultural groups. I believe the Hohokam have a redware, and then I believe, you know, many of the cultures to the south also have redwares, which kind of would point toward the idea that this was a technology that came from the South, either the idea of it came from the South uh, or the, the people who knew how to make it. Cause it's a combination of both the right kind of clay and a specific firing technique. So I hope that answers your question, Shannon. Thank you, Lisa. There is another question from Ruth. Were the cacao beads only trader or were they used to make the drink? For the Maya and Aztec, it is both. Uh, they were seen as luxury items. They were traded between Maya cities. They were offered as tribute, but it was also for the Maya elite to enjoy as a drink. Uh, it, the Aztecs are the ones and Spanish explorers give the recipes, but on some of the Maya ceramics, it says, you know, that beyond the tree fresh, but that you need to mix it well, make it frothy, make it very foamy for you to drink. And the one, so they saw it as a trade item, but trade item, but for the elite, it was also a great drink. And there's evidence that cacao is being consumed in Utah. It's, um, um, and um, Glenna has some ideas that it might, have you know might have been drunk but there's also um uh different forms of cacao that were used as a she calls it a travel food like where you pack together kind of a ball of masa of corn that also had cacao in it with all that good caffeine and energy and fat in it to to keep you going and so she's wondering if it might have been consumed in as a beverage but also in these different forms in utah can, can I add something? So with the, uh, this tradition of keeping, of, um, of doing this, especially the bosol that has uh, corn and, uh, and cacao, we, we, they can, uh, uh, people continue to do this in, in Mexico, in Chiapas. Um, there's lots of people that live in the, uh, in the mountains. They travel or they walk for long distances. And so they, they carry a pouch with, with bosol, the, the masa, the, um, the dough. And, um, and they drink, uh, so it's very accustomed to drink it in the middle of the day. So after a long, uh, a long walk um, or uh, a lot of travel, they, uh, they mix this with water and then, and this is the source of energy and it's, con it's considered a, a full meal uh, because of, of its nutritional value. I guess uh, that my answer also, uh, the question or the comment from Brian who says chocolate is sacred to traditions going way back. Is that because it gives strength, energy, and that chocolate feeling, right? In family like Esmeraldas, that continues today. And then um, we have a question also for Kimberly. Is there any evidence testing our depicted in artifacts that cacao would have been served to drink or offered to the gods with any other spice or other ingredient in Mayan culture? Yes, for the ancient Maya, yes, there is references to other ingredients being added. There is a sweet drink. Uh, they talk about a sweet cacao drink. Uh, so they're thinking that possibly vanilla, honey, things being added to it as well. So there were numerous ingredients that were added into uh, ancient Maya cacao. 
I believe vanilla grows all, only in that area as well, right? If I'm not mistaken. And uh, what I find interesting too is that connection with a uh, chocolate as a cultural fusion. Uh, nowadays in Mexico, it's very common to drink chocolate, like the image that I have in my background, and it's combined with cinnamon, which is a spice from uh, Asia. Um, there is another question here from Annie. Are cacao trees grown in orchards? What is the tree's lifespan? So um, it does, yeah, it grows in orchards, but I, I do not know how long the, uh, the trees live, but I do know that, um, that it takes about seven years approximately to, for the, uh, the tree to, um, to grow the fruit. Mm. Okay, yes, and I, I don't see any other questions. Feel free to submit your, your questions for now. Um, I wanted to mention Esmeralda, as, as you talked about other dishes that are prepared with, with chocolate, we know that mole is a significant dish in Mexican culture. And it makes me think as Lisa and Luke talk, how food is, the perfect uh, way to create these interconnections between our cultures, right? We think of mole, uh, including chocolate and all these spices that came as uh, America was colonized. And it's just a wonderful thing that we can uh, enjoy all these foods as well as uh, to continue with our um, traditional dishes such as pozol. It's something that I had experienced in the last two years with our Maya weavers. And I'm amazed to see, as you say, as I visited Chiapas last year, how people carry this bowl of corn. And that's basically their, their way to sustain and to keep energy as well as cacao. It's very common to see on the roads of uh, Southern Mexico and uh, Chiapas, you're driving and you see stands of pozol de cacao, which is this drink made of corn and cacao right there on the road as you're driving. And it's usually drink during the middle of the day. That's why our, um, most of the people go, okay, so they send you, uh, they would send us to, to get some pozole. Go get some pozole. And when, when it was already about noon, okay, we go get the pozole because we need to, to drink some of the pozole about, about this time. <laughs> there is another question from David. And the question says, oh, let's see. After the drinks were mixed, what was the lifespan before it had to be disposed or as a spoil? If the lifespan was short, was there any way for preservation of the drink? So um, the, it does have, like, uh, if you keep it um, out, um, not refrigerated, um, it does, it depends, it depends on the, on the, uh, the regions. Uh, in Chiapas, uh, most of us uh, drink it um, fresh uh, the same day. And we don't we don't usually drink it um, the next day. But in Tabasco, um, they they drink this uh, fermented uh, fermented pozol, and it is um, uh, the, it is a custom, and it has a, it also has an uh, um, ancestral tradition uh, of drinking it um, fermented. Yeah, I believe there is a, for what I know, the, my, the last time I was there last year, I learned that uh, they produce this drink called uh, posh. Posh is uh, from the Maya north side of Yucatan, where they make liquor of corn. And I tried a uh, posh with cacao, which is a fermented drink of uh, cacao and corn. Uh, someone is asking, Kimberly is asking, if it sounds delicious, is it sweet or salty or neither? Uh, Esmeralda or anybody else who has tried so this? The, uh, so the pozole is, um, it, it doesn't taste bitter uh, if, it, if you don't you add sweets, but we, uh, the tradition is to add sweets to that, uh, usually just um, brown sugar. And that's the, the tradition to drink it sweet. But um, for chocolate, my family has this tradition of uh, drinking, um, well, the, my mom and us as children, but not the grandchildren, <laughs> they, they like the sweet, uh, the sweet chocolate, but we usually drink it bitter uh, as um, that tradition from my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. 
So you gotta use get used to that to to the taste. There is one question also from Maggie. Are there object are the objects shown today available to view at both the UMFA and NHMU? Yes, both objects that I showed are on view there. They are together. And then just, you know, something, the mystical use or maybe use of the force. Uh, when we reinstall those objects, uh, our object comparator asked me how to, you know, what face of the vase or the drinking vase I wanted. And just by happenstance, I chose the site that the front, those four glyphs that say this is a drink for drink, drinking tree fresh cacao are facing you. So um, yes, they are on view. And so please come and see them. And as far as I know, none of the um, vessels that Glenna has tested for cacao are on display right now at NHMU, but you can see red wares, including this, that really cool pot that's been sutured together by someone who you know, cared for it a great deal. And Lisa, I believe there is also a collection of metates at the Natural History Museum of Utah, right, that have been found uh, in, so, in the southern region. Yeah, there's definitely lots of manos and metates. I don't know if there's evidence that any of them are used to grind cacao. That would be another interesting thing to test. That would be great to see, perhaps finding chilies and, and cacao and corn mixed in the DNA, and that will be the proof that Mole was also made it to, to, uh, to Utah. <laughs> well, any, any other comments, any other questions? I don't I'm actually curious. Yes, go ahead. I'm curious about something. The tall vessels, how were they used? Was that for storage of the chocolate or did they pass it around? Did everyone drink out of that vessel? Um, did they pour individual drinks? Like, does anyone know how those taller vessels were, were used for, for chocolate? I am not sure, but I can share what I, how it's done in some parts of Mexico. The jicara, or the little vessel made of uh, the plant that uh, Esmeralda shared, uh, in, during rituals, it's very common to pass along the jicara so everybody drinks from the same and the idea as i know is that as esmeralda said so beautifully is the concentration of the sacred ingredients that put this drink together and everybody drinks so it's all, it's almost like a communion to me you know when you go in, the, in in i grew up catholic and you know you go take the communion and everybody is one is person is giving or sharing from one cup it's the same idea of sharing from the same but Esmeralda, what would you say? Okay, so I remember a friend from Colombia, she was uh, from the Amazons and they, they did have this tradition of passing, passing around a vessel and everybody drinking from it. It was a, um, a, a ritual they had and it was uh, actually corn, um, a corn drink, not, not chocolate. But I, you know, from what we gather, maybe from, they might have that, may, they might've had that the same, Tradition, maybe. <laughs> yes. For the ancient Maya elite, they were personalized. Um, so that was just the one cup of that one Maya elite. And it was for uh, the glyph, kind of like they ran out of space, but it was for the fourth sun. So that was his personal cacao vessel drink uh, to, to drink chocolate. And from what we've seen, in other ceramics that have that the that drinking vessels for chocolate in the Maya in the ancient Maya that there were all personalized. Um, I think the same for the Aztec uh, later on, but I would I would be curious because the vessels from Chaco Canyon seem much taller than the uh, Maya and Aztec versions of where those have been shared or where those have been personalized too. I don't know the answer to that. I, I see one more question here for Esmeralda. Esmeralda, which brands of chocolate do you recommend after you have had the best chocolate? <laughs> Your microphone is off. Yeah, sorry. Uh, which brand? Um, I am not actually, I'm so sorry, but I'm not very fun of, uh, you know, um, 
uh, commercial chocolate. <laughs> um, so I, I guess uh, I, I don't have a special uh, commercial brand for chocolate. I've tested Hershey's and you know, it's okay, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to not, not to give you one advi uh, that advice yet. <laughs> Well, we need to have a workshop where you make it chocolate for all of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and then I hope uh, we, when we have it, uh, um, that many people come in and taste uh, the different recipes. It would be wonderful to share with you. There is one more question, and I think with this we, we end. What is the difference between cacao and cocoa? So from what I know is that, uh, well, Okay, from what I've tasted, um, I've tasted the cacao from from Peru and other um, other places, and it's um, maybe because I was born in Chiapas, um, the taste from the uh, the cacao from Chiapas it tastes better for me, but um, it does. Uh, I've heard, but I'm not. It's uh, it's not uh, it's not a research based. My opinion is not research based. That uh, the the cocoa is it has less nutrients than cacao, but I'm not. I'm not. Don't quote me on that. I don't know, but um, it it does. It, the uh, it does have. Um, the, the seeds are dif different in colors as well. The, our, our seeds are darker, and actually, yeah, in, in red. So in, um, I don't know if you can see there. So um, it, it is a little bit different. And, and these are uh, bigger se seeds. Uh, and I've seen other seeds that are smaller and, and the taste is di different. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, Ashley. Yeah, thank you everyone so much um, tonight for this conversation. I just have to say, um, while chocolate was the theme for tonight, I feel like um, community has been a big uh, theme within this conversation this evening. And just um, thinking about how um, researchers uh, learn in community together, how people in museums learn in communities together, and how we can also learn so very much from people um, who can speak to works of art from a personal and cultural perspective. And so I'm just so grateful for opportunities like this where we can have conversations and people can bring um, these just a different and complementary and really um, interesting perspectives together. So I'd like to thank our panelists for the evening. Thank you so much um, to each of you. Thank you, Esmeralda. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Luke. I'd also like to thank our amazing collaborator and partner, Fanny Blauer, Director of Artes de Mexico in Utah. Thank you so much for your time and energy um, in, in all of your work in this. Um, I'd like to thank Maggie Treely, who uh, coordinated this evening. Thank you, Maggie, uh, with UMFA. And thank you all for joining us this evening, for spending some time here, for contributing uh, your questions um, in this conversation as well. And I just want to mention that we will have um, another um, Mexican art and art history um, class conversation coming up again soon. And this one is Indigenous Perspectives on Women and Fertility. It should be fascinating. It should be an interesting evening. That will be Tuesday, August 10th, and that's at 6.30. So we hope you can join us for that. And again, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Take care and we'll see you soon. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. That was so wonderful, everyone. Oh. <sighs> Thank you so much, Maggie and Ashley, for organizing uh, the evening of handling all the logistics, and Fanny for for pulling us together. <laughs> well, I couldn't choose better people than than Lisa and Esmeralda, and for their voices and perspectives. I love what you do for the community and the way you communicate that to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. This Thank was so you, much really. fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Luke, Luke and uh, Lisa, for your wonderful presentations. I, I learned a lot from you, and, and it's amazing to feel connected to you know what you what you taught today. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ashley, Margie, and 
uh, Fanny for this opportunity. Mm. Maggie, I'm, I said Margie, no, Maggie, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> thank you, that was thank so you. interesting. I wanna take a class from you, Esmeralda. Oh, thank you, I, I, would, yeah. be, I would be honored. <laughs> I, I have to say, um, I invited Esmeralda because I think one of the greatest things that we did at the museum during the Maya exhibit was that workshop where the whole family came and we had teachers oh, and educators cool. and I don't remember, maybe about 50 people in the room and uh, just outside of the museum, the Esmeralda's family, they did absolutely everything from toasting the corn, the, 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 uh, the cacao beans to grinding it and people were looking at the whole process, process. right? Mm. Unbelievable. So I'm really, really hoping that we can do this in person. That I'm excited to do it again. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, we'll be there. Well, if you do, you need us to stay. Do you need me to stay? Or? No, I, I think I think we're good. I think we can call it an evening. Um, but I'll be in touch with all of you tomorrow. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Have a great night. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.